Man, is that recording? Hi, and welcome to Terry Talks Movies. This time around, I got a haul from Umbrella Entertainment of six movies. Some of them are in collector's editions, some of them are in standard editions, but all of them have a virtue that I only realised when I got the box of this stuff today. And that virtue, which is kind of rare in cinema these days, is that none of them is a sequel, a prequel, or a remake. They're all original intellectual properties. And I've got a great love for that. I think that's the way I like my cinema. I don't mind watching Marvel Cinematic Universe movies and all those other ones. But I've got a special love for movies that are original. And all of these ones are. Even though the first one I'm going to talk about is an Austrian film that was remade by Americans in 2022. Because of course it is. The movies that I'm going to show you that Umbrella have put out for this month are original movies. And thank you to Umbrella Entertainment for giving me these ones to review. The first movie is a thriller from Austria, made in 2014, directed by Veronica Franz. And it's a movie called Goodnight Mummy, which is an odd little thriller about a pair of twins who are in a country house. They're, they're nine years old. Their mother comes back from being in hospital. And she's covered in bandages because she's had plastic surgery. Now, as time progresses and as their mother acts a little bit oddly, the twins suspect that the woman underneath the bandages is not their mother. And so you get this war between the two twins and their maybe mother. And it, it develops into a quite a suspenseful horror movie. I've heard great things about this movie. I did get the spoilers from this movie from the American version because I was reading a review of the American version which gave it away. But I still want to see the original Austrian version. It's set on a farm which has some cornfields around it. It's very atmospheric. There was a movie in the 1970s made from a Tom Tryon novel called The Other. And it's got a lot of that kind of vibe to it. So there it is. I love the artwork on this hard case box. This is a limited edition in the collector's edition of 1000. Collector's editions are only available from the Umbrella website. Standard editions you can get from elsewhere, places like JB Hi-Fi if you're in Australia. But the collector's editions you've got to get from the website. So my advice is if you're interested in this stuff, get on the mailing list for Umbrella Entertainment and they will tell you what's upcoming so you can pick and choose what you want see whether you want standard or collector's editions and just make a more informed decision about it now this one is region b it says so on the back on the back you've got all of the stuff that's in the special edition now the extras are an audio commentary with alexandra heller nicholas a video essay by andy marshall roberts stockholm film festival interview with the director veronica france and severin fiala vice talks film an interview with veronica france and severin fiala and a trailer so there's the box. I love the artwork on this release. It's got special artwork made especially for it. And it is wonderfully creepy. There's the slipcover. There's the artwork on the front. With the ants as a motif. On the back, one of the twins. Inside, again we've got alternative artwork, which is very kind of Saul Bass. It's reminiscent of Saul Bass's graphic design, and I like that a lot and there is the back it is a reversible cover because they have of course the version with the australian censorship classification down here there it is there with the disc there's also a double-sided poster that artwork which i find striking and this artwork which i find striking and creepy i'm looking forward to this movie there are times when i want a creepy atmospheric horror film this sounds like my kind of jam I'm not inclined to watch the American remake because in my experience, and people can disagree if you like, tell me if you do, American remakes of other language movies tend to be watered down or skewed towards American cultural norms in a way that I find a bit dismissive of the original. Of course, the original filmmakers make money from selling the rights to American film companies and all that, and I understand the economics of it, but it's not something I particularly like. Now, as well as all of that, of course you get a booklet. There's one of the twins floating on a raft in a lake. There is a Q&A with Severin Fiala and Veronica Franz. Transcribed there. And maybe the one from the extras on the disc, I don't know. And there is an essay called The Mirror Has Two Faces, Twins, Trauma and Goodnight Mummy, which is there. And there's also, which is something that Umbrella do really well, there's also 
some stuff about the creation of the graphic art for the advertising campaigns and the physical media i love that stuff i like the way that they give us how the artwork was created as well just as a little extra bonus i'm hopeless at drawing things i love seeing the way professionals do it there are also art cards here there's that one i can show you all the art cards on this unlike one of the other movies we've got in this set twins in creepy masks always a joy there is the mother with a bug on her face Creepy twins again. The mother looking through the Venetians. One of the twins in the cornfield. Cornfields are always creepy in horror movies as well. And this one of what may be a basement. As I said, I'm looking forward to this one because there are times when I want a nice, creepy, atmospheric, suspenseful horror movie in my life. And that is going to fit the bill nicely. The next cab off the rig requires a history lesson. After World War I, a whole bunch of soldiers came back and they wanted to earn a living, so a lot of them wanted to become farmers, so the Australian and the state governments gave them land to become farmers on. It wasn't their land, it was belonged to the Indigenous people, but they gave farmers, returned soldiers, land across Australia to farm. In Western Australia, there were peculiar conditions to that farming land. First off, it was marginally able to sustain crops because... It was on the fringe of the desert. Secondly, and they found this out after they'd given the land to the settlers and they started building their farms and laying their crops. Every year during the breeding season, thousands of emus were coming in from the desert to the coast during the breeding season. They migrated naturally, had done for millions of years, but they stomped through crops and they knocked down fences and they wrecked things because emus are a pretty solid unit. And en masse, they're going to do a lot of damage to any infrastructure somebody puts up. And so, in its finite wisdom, the Australian government declared war on emus in Western Australia and fought a war against them. So, they had a lot of material left over from World War I. The Australian Army went out and fought a war against emus. They had a whole bunch of rifles and Lewis guns and other things and tried to get them, but the emus ran away. Emus are not stupid in their own environments even though they do have tiny heads. And so they weren't particularly successful in this, and they kind of gave up after a while, even though they shot a couple of thousand of them. Didn't really put a dent into the migration in any significant way. Later on, they found another solution to it, which is reinforced fencing around the agricultural areas, so that when migration was required by the emus, they could go around it and reach the coast by a kind of circuitous route. That fun and stupid part of Australian history. A movie has been made about it. In 2018, there was a short film made about it, very much comedic, very much treating the Emu War like it was a war against a human enemy. So it's got that kind of skew to it, which I really like. And that movie was expanded into a feature film called The Emu War. It's directed by Jamie Morrissey, Lisa Feinberg and John Campbell. And it's a hoot. I've seen the trailer and it's mad. It doesn't take itself seriously. Most of the actors are Australian comedians. There are people like Luke McGregor in there. There's also Damien Callanan playing the head officer. The special effects are crazily bad. There's bad CG in it. But it's done hilariously. And in fact, I'll get the jade card off this so you can see. It's that kind of movie. Now, strangely enough, there's another movie about the Emmy War being made at the moment. A feature film, which is an action comedy, it says big budget they brought in people from overseas to star in it and they chose incredibly badly whoever was the casting director in this movie needs to be replaced immediately they got john cleese whose opinions lately have been let's say not the kindest about a number of different social issues they've got rob schneider who can't get a gig in america because of his opinions and even his daughter doesn't like him and a bunch of other people and it's one of those movies where you think yeah, this one's probably not going to play at all. It's going to end up on a second-rate streaming service at some stage. But this one, based on the trailer, is funny and fun. And the people involved in it are good at what they do. They're comedians. They know how to time things. They're, they're great. This one is a limited edition of 800 copies, which is a shame because I would like to see it do really big. Again, it's Region B. The extras on it are an audio commentary of writer-directors Jay Morrissey, Lisa Feinberg and John Campbell and the writer-creator Jonathan Schuster. I think he did the original short film. 
There's a VFX breakdown deleted scenes, the short film itself, the Emu War from 2018, and a trailer. So there's that. There's that, of course. And under the slipcover, we get that heroic image. And on the back you get that. And, of course, we get a booklet. I love the way they've got these heroic images in this booklet. Now it's got a synopsis, the origin of the project, vision, world, production, style and execution, casting. And a lot of the images were puppets, so you've got these people in blue screen leotards holding up the puppets. I'm going to have a fun with this one. I hear great things about it. It's got its tongue firmly in its cheek. And there again, somebody holding up the puppets in blue screen leotard. Need some good comedies like this. Everybody's taking themselves so seriously lately. And the Emu War is one you probably should get. It's not going to be around for long because it is 800 copies. But I suspect if you get it, you're going to have a hoot. And for me, it feels like something that's going to be a cult movie and is going to be well regarded in the future. So I'm going to tentatively recommend that one based on the trailer and based on what I know about the actors involved. Should be a lot of fun. From there, we go to Osploitation because who doesn't like Osploitation? This is a movie from 1980, which has got a serious theme but is basically a car chase action movie with a serious theme wrapped around it. It was directed by Ian Barry and stars Steve Bisley, Anna Maria Winchester, Ross Thompson. You also get Hugh Keys Byrne in there. You get Roger Ward. And in a tiny little cameo, you get some geezer called Mel Gibson. This one's all region, so anybody can get this one. Cha the Chain Reaction. This has had previous releases, uh, but this is the collector's edition release. And the Chain Reaction is just full tilt, balls to the wall action the story is this there's a nuclear waste facility in australia which has had a leak and radio highly radioactive material is leaking out it's going into the water table it's going to affect thousands of people but the people running it are trying to hide that a couple played by steve bisley and anna maria winchester stumble into the area and find a severely radiated scientists who they get into their car they're going to take him to a hospital they don't know what's going on and they get captured by the people running the nuclear waste facility it's like balls to the wall action there's a cut this car chases all over the place and it's got that serious theme of what do you do with nuclear waste a theme which is very timely in australia because our federal opposition which is in the pockets of the mining industry is talking about nuclear reactors in australia it's going to take 20 years to build them they're going to be incredibly expensive to build and run and nobody who isn't in the mining industry wants them so it's a very cogent theme for australia there is the hard case on the back it says in a peaceful morning in paradise somebody made a mistake and two young lovers were forced to run for their lives there's the people in the radiation suits now i've got to be careful with this stuff that i show you because some of the images are not safe for YouTube. I'll show you the slipcover. That I can show you. Inside we've got the discs. A fast drive to paradise turns into a nuclear nightmare. The chain reaction. So there's that. As I said, this is all region. And it's a two disc release. There are a lot of special features on this one. And I'm going to hold that up. And I'm going to freeze frame that so that you can read them at your leisure. Inside, I can't show you all of the inside cover because there is unclad female nudity in it. But I can show you that part. I think I really did that just to mess up YouTubers. We also have a double-sided poster here with the Japanese poster which are always fantastically designed and dynamic as hell. And that one. A great old exploitation movie poster. We do get a booklet as well. There's the cover of it. Inside you've got Ian Barry, the man at the edge of the freeway. He's the director, so there's an interview with him or something about him at least. Like I said, I've got to be careful with this. Chain Reaction, producer recollections from David Elphick, who was a producer and was a producer on a number of exploitation movies. There's an extract from Cinema Papers, the big um, movie newspaper magazine that was out at the time, with an extended coverage of the chain reaction. 
The Rogue Warrior Goes Nuclear Connections Between the Chain Reaction and Mad Max by Luke Buckmaster. There's the essay by Luke Buckmaster. A really good lot of information there. Now, here's the hard part. I've got some lobby cards. Steve Bisley there. I don't really a Winchester getting grabbed by one of the guys. There's the nuclear guys. Like I said, I can't show you all of this. Decontamination. Bad guy getting hit by a muscle car. Always a nice thing. Patrick Ward and Anna Maria Winchester in a tense scene. That's the one I can't show you. I'll put that away for later. And there's that. The chain reaction is just balls to the wall action. It goes full tilt boogie. Great stunt work, great car stunts. It's got that osploitation dynamism in the car chases and things like that. A lot of fun, and giving a prestige release like this is a good thing in my book. I've got the other edition of it, I think, somewhere here. But having this one with all of the extras and all of the contextualization you get from the book and the extras on the disc is, for me, a lot of fun. And as this one's actually a limited edition of 500 in the collector's edition. And as the card says, it's all region there. Next up, we've got a little horror movie from 2024. Directed by Stephen Boyle who is a really good special effects guy. The producers are, the, among the producers, you've got the Sperry Brothers, who did Predestination and Undead and a bunch of other movies. Stars John Noble and a bunch of other people. It's region B only, limited edition of 500. So if you are interested in small Australian horror movies, you might want to pick this one up post haste. The Demon Disorder. Now, my good friend Grant Watson over at Fiction Machine really loves this movie. And Grant's got impeccable taste, much better than mine. So the setup's pretty simple. A guy called Graham, who's retired from life, he lives alone in a garage workshop and hides from the world. I'm kind of paraphrasing from the back here. It's been this way since the death of his father and the estrangement from his two brothers. Haunted by his past, this is a life he has accepted, so he's living as a recluse. Then one day his brother calls. When the youngest brother is believed to be demonically possessed, the two estranged brothers, Graham and Jake, reunite to confront a dreadful family secret looking forward to that one i will watch anything based on grant's recommendations he's a lovely guy and i like what he does with fictionmachine.com so you've got the j card there with all the info on the back the extras are special features are an audio commentary with steve boyle concept art slideshow a making of featurette a creature showing the creature, and I've seen a tiny bit of the image from this of the monster, and it looks pretty bloody good. And a trailer. So there's one side of the slipcover. There's the other. Inside we get alternative artwork with John Noble there on the right. John Noble, you might remember, played that scientist in Fringe for a number of years. There's the back of it. There's also a booklet here, which I'm not going to show you because it gives away the monster a bit there's a reversal piece there with the australian censorship thing removed i usually make it so that the censorship things removed because censorship is not really my bag there are mostly things from the dp and the creature effects stuff in this movie that are in this booklet it's, a, it's not a, a big one but it does have a lot of good imagery and a lot of good information in it like i said i'm not going to show it to you because i don't want to spoil the movie even though i spoiled it for myself just by opening that booklet the demon disorder when it was shown in the number of film festivals i heard good things from a number of people then i heard good things from grant as well and i'm looking forward to this one small australian film but these small australian horror movies are starting to really hit big internationally they're getting a lot of regard and a lot of views internationally and of course they end up on platforms like shutter and if they're really lucky netflix we're looking forward to that one it's probably the second of these i'm going to watch after the emu war because i want something a bit light we're down to the last two and the last one's a banger this one's kind of a drama thriller from 2004 it's got a very generic name which is a bit of a shame now this is a collector's edition there are only 500 of these and it's irresistible now, I'll tell you the special features first. Audio commentary with writer-director Ann Turner and executive producer Sue Maslin. Film locations of Irresistible, a video essay by Paul Hagel. Behind-the-scenes featurette with cast and crew and a trailer. The movie stars Susan Sarandon, Sam Neill and Emily Blunt, so they got in international people for this Australian movie. 
And by the way, Sam Neill is a New Zealander, not an Australian. Got a slip cover there. There's Sam Neill and Susan Sarandon on that one. Inside we've got a very 2004 kind of artwork for that cover. And the back. Basically it's the story of a um, woman called Sophie, played by Susan Sarandon, whose husband played by Sam Neill. He's getting close to a woman who started working at the place where he works and she starts worrying that they're going to have an affair and all of that kind of thing. So it's a suspense thriller kind of thing. A secret is not safe if the truth has a witness, it says. Inside you've got the alternative uh, flipped um, cover. And there are posters as well. And there's also a book. So there's that poster. And there's that poster. A lot of these smaller Australian films didn't get enough oxygen at the time. are starting to get releases, which I find quite um, interesting and, and a good thing. Now, there's a booklet. There's Susan Sarandon. The booklet has got, he said, opening up carefully. Production notes. There is an essay by Athena Bellis about the movie. And another one by Dibby Horton. And there's, again, the creation of the artwork. don't know much about this movie apart from the fact that it is that kind of triangle thriller kind of thing. I like the fact it's being put out. It's a movie I didn't even know existed, but I'm willing to give it a go and just see. Uh, um, sometimes movies don't get recognised because they don't have the um, promotional budgets to do that, even though they are made on a fairly OK budget. Sometimes they just don't hit because something else hits big because something else has a lot of promotion behind it. And so this release, for me, is kind of interesting because I can go into a cold and just evaluate it myself and see whether it's my kind of thing or not. And I like doing that because often I'll watch a movie like this and realise that I really like it. And even if it is outside my normal comfort zone as far as cinema is concerned, I can enjoy it and that expands that comfort zone just that little bit. The last one is a movie that I saw with my nephew in the cinema down at the Sun in Yarraville. Billy came down from Sydney and we went to the movies, as we always do. And we saw Late Night with the Devil. This again is the collector's edition. And it's got some really banger extras on it. Now, if you haven't seen Late Night with the Devil, it's a mockumentary about a late night TV show, a Tonight Show kind of thing, with a host called Jack Delroy, played by David S. Malchin, which did a Halloween episode in 1977, the last ever episode of Late Night with Jack Delroy. And in that, he gets a parapsychologist and a parapsychologist to bunker on, and a young girl who is said to have been possessed by the devil. Now, the whole movie, with some exceptions is shot like a 1977 TV show. It's in 3 to 2 aspect ratio, and it looks like a VHS tape. Because the conceit is that somebody has found the VHS tape of this hidden last episode of this TV show, and everything that goes wrong on Halloween, on Jack Delroy's show. Now, Des Malchin's Jack Delroy is an interesting character. His wife has died recently, he's just coming back into it. He's going up against Johnny Carson's Tonight Show, and he hasn't quite been able to hit his stride and beat Carson in the ratings. Then he's got secrets. There's a parapsychologist who comes on with this young girl. There's the guy debunking it. There's a magician who comes on board, a guy a little bit like Uri Geller, who um, has some interesting arcs in the movie. There's the usual comic sidekick in there. 
It's just got a perfect evocation of a certain era of Tonight Show, based as much as anything on the Don Lane Show here in Australia, which did these kind of psychic things where Don Lane, the host of the show, was really in favour of psychics. And then James Randi, a famous debunker of psychics, came on and got chucked off the show and Don Lane live on air told him to piss off. So it's got all of that background in real grounded history. This is an Australian film. It was filmed down at Docklands Studios in Melbourne, but it does have an American star because it's, the conceit is it's an American tonight show. And this edition, the Night Owls edition, is something marvellous. This is a limited edition of 3,500 copies. And it's region B, but the extras are fantastic. There's a behind-the-scenes reel. The making of Night Owls music, South by Southwest 2003 screening Q&A with the directors and cast. BTS Stills Gallery and Night Owls broadcast cut of the movie. The directors of the film are Colin and Cameron Cairns. And this is a really fantastic edition. If you're into horror movies like this, you might want to check this one out. So of course you've got the hard case there. And inside, we've got a facsimile edition of the book by the parapsychologist Dr. June Ross Mitchell is in the movie Conversations with the Devil. The inside has actually got the live TV event that shocked a nation. Notes on the 1977 Night Owls Halloween special. There's a whole bunch of good production design stuff on how they designed the studio, which is a single set for most of the movie. They've got a whole bunch of the special effects, makeup and storyboards as well which is really nice. I like this kind of stuff. Costume designs, camera plotting as well. They've got the camera plotting in there and all the um, design of the promotional materials. So that's one of the things you get, but it's not all. And this stuff is so well curated. I love it. There's a fake TV guide with Jack Delroy on it. All in the back, it's got Gus McConnell, the sidekick on the TV show doing a cigarette ad and inside it's just like a tv guide with all the stuff related to night owl show with jack Dory, as if it was a real thing and they even got ads for real tv programs that were on at the time this is beautifully detailed <laughs> even got a mention of oh calcutta which gets a name check in the movie that's beautiful, I love that. We've also got art cards. I mean, I haven't even got to the disc yet. We've got art cards. A satirical cartoon about Jack Delroy going up against Carson. I like that one. But there's more. There's actually the disc, the movie itself. There it is there. That's Malchin is fantastic in this film. Does an incredible job playing the complex character. And you have the posters, reversible posters. There's that. And there's that. And there is one more thing. In this edition, you also get the found VHS tape of that episode, which had been missing for years. A real, genuine VHS tape of the footage purporting to be from that TV show. I don't have a VCR at the moment, but as an extra, that is something... They went to incredible lengths, basically, to do this. But Late Night with the Devil, I enjoyed a lot. Middle-aged Good Girl and I are going to re-watch it, in fact on this edition when we get a chance to. It's, it's worth re-watching. You watch it through the first time and it hits you in the face. Second time you can kind of analyse it and go, oh yeah, that's great. And maybe get a little more out of it the second viewing. And I like a movie that gives you that kind of value. So there's the stuff from this month for Martin Brawler Entertainment. As I said at the start, none of these are owing to anything else. They're original IPs. They're original movies that aren't sequels, prequels, reimaginings, remakes, anything like that. They're original stuff. And that's to be encouraged in movies at the moment, where so much of the big stuff is 
retreads and continuing stories that didn't need to be continued. So thanks again to Umbrella Entertainment. Let me know which of these you like. Because they go from comedy to horror, which is pretty much the axis my movie watching goes most of the time. So thanks very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. You can also support the channel by becoming a channel member or by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash terrytalksmovies. Next up, we've got Science Fiction Saturday coming up, and I've got a double feature for you there. And then on Monday, I've got a really nice little listicle of 10 interesting movie things. I'm not going to talk more about that now. But until all of that stuff happens, watch some good movies, watch some bad movies. Watch this movie. And I'll catch you next time.